traumatic incidents in our lives more than just that? Can they actually become part of us and get passed on to our children and our children's children? A growing body of research is proving just that. Called intergenerational trauma, several events in history provide compelling examples. Take, for example, the Civil War. UCLA researchers studied the health records of 4,600 children born after the war to Union soldiers who had been POWs in horrific conditions, subjected to starvation. The sons of those POWs were 11% more likely to die at any given age after 45 years old than the sons of non-POW veterans, showing that events in someone's life can affect the lives of the next generation. Dr. Brian Dias is an Emory University and Yerkes National Primate Research Center neuroscientist studying intergenerational trauma. And so epigenetics is one of the new frontiers that's allowing us to understand how the environment interacts with our genetic book of life. This book of life, our DNA, has instructions for making our eyes green or our hair wavy. And epigenetics is the way those genes are turned on and off. Things that happen to us in our lives cause tiny chemical tags to be added or removed from our DNA. These tags turn those genes on or off. Under supervision of the American Red Cross. One of the most striking examples in literature are studies with descendants of Holocaust survivors. And what researchers have shown is that these descendants of Holocaust survivors, even if they did not experience the Holocaust themselves, those descendants had lower levels of a stress hormone compared to descendants of individuals who did not experience the Holocaust. The joke is that our parents or grandparents used to walk uphill both ways, sometimes in the snow, to school. It seems that every generation thinks the ones that come after them have it too easy. The truth is, when our parents or grandparents tell us about their life struggles, it does influence us. But intergenerational trauma is different. It's not transmitted socially, it's biological. Things that happen to us in our lives can change our eggs and sperm. The leading candidate for what carries information across generations are these tiny molecules called RNA which find them, we find in sperm and we find in eggs. And what I want you to think about is RNA being puppeteers. They're, they're orchestrating, they're puppeteering how genes might be read or not as the embryo develops. You can have an embryo developing one way and the brain wiring one way, for example, to allow for a mental health state to develop in adulthood, or you could have the embryo develop another way, the brain wiring another way, to allow for a protective effect. And so that's how we think intergenerational influences of stress uh, are actually perpetuating across generations. If the trauma happens when a woman is pregnant, it can cause changes to the developing baby. Which way to go? Researchers at Mount Sinai School of Medicine studied pregnant women present during the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center. The women who developed post-traumatic stress disorder passed on PTSD markers to their babies, unlike babies whose mothers did not develop PTSD. As the research grows, so does our understanding of trauma throughout history, from genocide to wars to famine to slavery. They leave a mark on the descendants of those who suffered. What I would like to talk to you about this morning is how we think that experience is registered by biological systems and then how that might filter into how we perceive the world. Dr. Dias is part of the Emory Tibet Science Initiative. He teaches neuroscience to Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns. In 2016, he talked to the Dalai Lama about his research. What we now understand is that these traumas are laying down marks or they're removing marks in the sperm or in the egg. And that sets up the future generations to bear these imprints of ancestral trauma. And now the COVID-19 pandemic has gripped the globe. Will this lead to intergenerational trauma? For intergenerational influences of stress to perpetuate across generations, they have to be extremely jarring and they have to perpetuate and they have to persist for 
a long period of time, both of which are conditions that COVID seems to check off. Dr. Dyer says children who might be exposed to COVID-related stressors could be vulnerable in this pandemic because of impacts on their developing brains. Dyer also says that because we don't have a measurable sense for how parents' behavior and the sperm and eggs of childbearing age people will be affected by COVID-related stress, speculation on how COVID will impact future generations is just that for now. The decades to come will slowly prove out how this time in our world changed us and our descendants. There's a healthy body of research in the stress field about whether a stress is controllable or not controllable and whether it's predictable versus unpredictable. And with COVID, we are firmly in the unpredictable and uncontrollable realm. The uncontrollability and the unpredictability of COVID at this point will result in detrimental influences of stress which could perpetuate for a long, long time to come. The thought that we have inherited the trauma of our parents and grandparents and the thought that the trauma we experience could impact our children and their children is overwhelming. But remember, there is nature and there is nurture, and nurture is powerful too. Whenever we talk about intergenerational influences of stress or trauma, people often think about the gloom and doom that it spells for future generations. What our research is showing is that the die is not cast. We can reverse the influences of intergenerational stress and trauma uh, in, in several ways. Dr. Dyer says having rich social groups, practicing mindfulness, even dietary interventions can help. So can putting good out into the world. Just as you can perpetuate negativity about stress and trauma, maybe there's the potential to perpetuate the positive aspects of kindness and compassion and empathy. And so my call to action to everyone is in our own little worlds to maybe engage in that small act of kindness, of compassion, of empathy.